Hello, I'm Llewellyn King, the host of MECFS Alert. Today's program comes from Palo Alto, California, and my guest is Chris Armstrong of the Open Medicine Foundation, where you are scientific liaison. Chris, welcome That's to the right. broadcast. Thank you very much for having me, Llewellyn. That means you are a research scientist, but you do this administrative job, or? Yes, so I have somewhat of an administrative role at our Open Medicine Foundation. I'm still able to do some research as well, but I also kind of work as a bit of a filter in a way, just talking to the outside community. Um, when they come and have questions for Open Medicine Foundation, I talk to them about scientific matters, um, and I talk to other researchers and other people who might be interested in researching um, on this disease. And then the idea is to then tell them in ways in which they could possibly um, help or get in contact with uh, Ron Davis or any of the other uh, directors and of the uh, collaborative research centres. And you have spent your entire career, you got your PhD in this field? Yes. So that's I, very unusual. Yes. I, there are I, not many people who have been with it from day one. That's right. That's that's my all I've probably ever known has been MECFS. However, actually, I didn't really get myself into the MECFS field until about 2016. So I started researching in 2009, and so I've been here for 10 years. Um, but my main areas that I was interested in was metabolomics at the very beginning, because what we did was we. I learned about how to apply metabolomics to disease and then applied that to MECFS. And we Would you first. explain metabolomics? So metabolomics is the measure of metabolites within the body. And so for metabolites, you will know them as uh, sugars, amino acids, fatty acids. What we know them as scientists are metabolites. And your body probably has, you know, hundreds of well-known ones, but then you'll have hundreds of thousands of secondary metabolites. So there's, there's quite a number of them in the body. And the basic premise for life is actually trying, the cells are actually trying to change these metabolites from one thing to the other to harness or ex extract energy from them and build themselves out of them. So they're an important building block, block for life, essentially. And what they can tell you about disease is they tell you probably everything that's happening within the person at, at, at one time. And so the reason why that's valuable is in terms of uh, measuring metabolites, they're so closely linked to um, what we call phenotype, which is symptom expression. But also they will change dramatically from time to time. When we're sitting down like this, they'll be changed compared to when I eat some food, compared to when I go for a walk. They'll be constantly changing and somewhat indicative of the behavior that's going on. And so when you strip that back, you can kind of find, I guess, an alert of something going wrong within the body somewhere. And that's why they've been such a valuable tool for looking into MECFS because they kind of are um, signals or alerts to things that are occurring. How do, we, how do we identify them or study them or isolate them? So you generally isolate them from, you can isolate them from any different areas. Um, you can isolate them from cells, you can isolate them from uh, biofluids, you can isolate them from tissues, you can isolate them from anything like that. So when I say tissues, I mean body tissues, muscles, um, liver, those sort of things are a lot harder to come by. What we commonly look into is blood and urine. And sometimes you'll look into fecal samples with them. So they're everywhere. And they'll be in bacteria, they'll be in all different cells of the body. And what are they telling us about ME that you learned to this point? So at this point, it looks like um, some of the main issues that we found from the data was that there is uh, increased usage of amino acids for energy production in MECFS patients, which is not uncommon with any disease state. It's not uncommon for that to happen because that is something that occurs when the body is stressed. Um, but we're trying to find is uh, the differences of that because there seems to be some unusual patterning in the way that they're using these amino acids as well. And so part of that is um, what I'll be talking about at the symposium, at the private, sorry, at the private working science meeting um, in the next few days. And um, you're referring to the OMF meeting in Palo Alto. Yes, the, that's right, the Stanford um, collaborative meeting that's occurring here in, uh, in Palo Alto. And uh, where do you go from here, having identified this area of research? 
what's the next stage? So I've been doing a lot of collaboration. So part of it for me is about extending this type of research to a lot of other projects. And collaboration is a key way to do that. Um, it's a specific type of tool or analysis, metabolomics. And what I've been doing is applying it to a lot of different other studies with other people, looking at genome studies, people who are looking at immune cells, and people looking at many different other areas, microbiology, people looking at um, neuroinflammation, all that sort of stuff are the things that we want to work part and parcel with so that we can use this to characterize those problems. Because while this is a good idea, for globally it's metabolomics is good to use to find an alert of problems in the whole body. It's kind of subtle because the things that we're looking at are blood and urine and they take samples from everywhere within the body. So to get more specific, it's much better, and this is how metabolomics is usually used for other diseases, is actually to characterize specific problems. So you find a problem with um, someone who has like heart disease and you want to characterize those issues. So they have a problem with multiple sclerosis, you want to characterize that. And so if someone has a neuroinflammation, you want to characterize that. And the way you characterize that is with the metabolites. Do you have, Chris, any examples of where the study of metabolomics has led to uh, a cure in some other disease? So, yes. Um, so, obviously, metabolomics itself is a newer technology. Um, studies on metabolism in general have led to a number of different understandings of a lot of diseases, uh, probably di diabetes included for initial signal. That's probably a well-known one, um, which was a long time ago. Uh, mitochondrial diseases, there's, there's a plethora of diseases that metabolism has helped to uncover um, in combination with genetics and proteomics, and they usually worked all together. Uh, at this stage, sorry, at this stage with the because metabolomics is still growing as a field in itself, um, the area that we'd want to try and use to find out about diseases is really just metabolism. Metabolomics is a tool you use to get information for that. And uh, has this left you optimistic that we will, in some reasonable period of time, uh, untie the Gordian knot of ME? Yes, yes, there, that's definitely a, a high level of optimism in terms of what will be produced um, because of uh, the information that we're gathering is moving closer and closer. So as a scientist, we can see the changing um, pattern because we see the new information and the better information coming through. So for people, I guess, patients um, and people listening in, I think they're following the research and they're, they're looking into it, but it might be a little bit more subtle to them than um, it is to us because you can definitely tell the type of work that's occurring, the type of information we're gathering. I think we're close. It's just the, it's coming down to trying to understand this disease because understanding this disease, it's not necessarily going to be something like um, you have a pathogen and then you have this disease and it's created by something trying to do you harm within your body or whether it's a complete genetic breakdown that you have a, a significant problem because you don't have this protein. I mean, it's not going to be something as, 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 as across the board, it's not going to be something like that, but it's just trying to work out what, could, what is the way we can tie this disease together. Are there any small revelations that you've had which give you a better understanding of ME today than, say, five or ten years ago? Sure. So. Um, Definitely, some of the parts about it, listening to some of the other researchers and the way that they think about the disease. One element to me that has been very interesting has been the amino acid usage, um, largely because of what that means for the body. To use amino acids for energy production, you're required to create compounds which are somewhat toxic to the body. And so by doing that, you know, you're putting the body under an elevated level of stress if you're doing that and uh, those things can have consequences. Um, that's one thing. There are the, the way you look at the disease in general, um, thinking about it maybe as a heterogeneous disease as well. These are things that have really helped in the understanding, I think. And how do we move from understanding to the next step? How do we synthesize our knowledge into a course of action? So 
I guess working more and more with uh, other people. I mean, people have been finding some really interesting, great stuff that, that could be very valid for the disease itself. Um, some of the work on neuroinflammation is another thing, part that, that has been very interesting. And so I guess working collaboratively, taking the tools that we have and we, the ways that we're thinking about everything together and then working together and then kind of pulling out the important parts from it. But, and also longitudinal studies. I'm a big believer in longitudinal research for this disease because that's, so longitudinal study is collecting multiple samples over a period of time. And so you want to measure the fluctuations of that person going from good to, good to bad to back to good, you know, from in terms of their disease progression. Um, and sometimes that can occur week to week, but it's a good way of typing what metabolites or what problems might be arising when they feel worse than when they feel better. Um, that's one way of characterizing the disease. And then another way for looking into it that is, I find very interesting is the um, measurement, I guess, of these people as individuals, so trying to determine their genomic components that might be problematic and then trying to work out how that affects the metabolites in each individual. And so what we're talking about really is personalized medicine. And uh, how, do, how does your research fit in with government research? How do you dovetail with other researchers, efforts at Harvard, efforts in Florida, etc.? So we, um, well the, the dovetailing really happens, I guess, I mean you can't collaborate with everybody and uh, you wish you could. But re reality, you know, you see, you go to meetings, you hear about the research that they're doing, the results they're progressing, and that's very helpful for you in trying to piece together what you understand. Uh, and that's the best way of doing it for now. Uh, but we're not so worried about replicating other people's work at this stage. Um, the field really isn't big enough that anyone's stepping on each other's toes. Um, but in, in many ways, that's important for research, is to have that replication of information, especially if it's found in different ways. It's a really fantastic way to confirm. So if this. you get the same result from different pathways, yeah, yeah, that's then you then it's validated. Yeah, then you have to is, do that anyway. Then it is truth. Yeah, that's right. That's how, you know, that's when it's validated and that's when it's truth. Um, but no one is really doing exactly the same work as far as I know. I haven't met any that were exactly the same in the way that they do research. Even though there's been probably now 10 or so metabolomic studies done. Um, none of them have been done exactly the same as each other. What is your largest frustration? Uh, funding <laughs> would be the largest frustration um, uh, for me, but also uh, misunderstanding, mischaracterization of the disease. That was one of the most impactful components to this illness for me. When I was a young researcher, I did my master's in this and all well, the equivalent of a, of a master's in Australia. And then I went on to do my PhD. But that decision to do this, my master's was based on learning metabolomics. Uh, my decision to do my PhD was based on uh, the, the unfairness of the way people with ME-CFS are treated. I think it's, um, it becomes a responsibility, the lack of research that was occurring, the lack of respect that it was getting. Um, and I think you see how much more valuable you can be in this area as opposed to anywhere else. So your thesis was on the acceptability of this disease as a disease. So my well, so my thesis was on metabolomics in uh, M, uh, gut bacteria and its relationship to uh, and blood and urine, and so just trying to characterise the disease through metabolomics. But my reason for doing it, for getting into it, um, for committing myself for another four or five years for a PhD was to really follow into that area. What caused you to get into ME, CFS? Uh, I mean, w most people it seems to be through a family connection, knowing somebody who had the disease. What was your trigger? So that's what I was, I guess that's what I was trying to describe is my, the trigger was meeting the patients, um, speaking to them, but also speaking to clinicians about what I was doing when I would go to the doctor myself or speaking to people in the public, you know, Generally, they will ask you what you do, and you explain it. And people tend to have the missed, the wrong idea about this disease. Uh, and that's something that was very frustrating, I think, because um, 
how can so many people be this wrong? <laughs> and I guess it's part of trying to explain that to them and, and build the information so that they could see what I could see um, by looking at the science literature and speaking to the patients of the validity of the disease, the severity of it, and also um, the respect that's required for it. Uh, as a final question, which is not probably directly related, but a lot of interest in mold and this <laughs> disease. Yes. Uh, what are your views on that? So mold itself is a stressor for um, a lot of people, and it's a stressor, I'm sure, for a lot of people with MECFS. Um, and that's part and parcel to the way that we look at this disease. We could, we could, one of, I mean, I forget who, who wrote this, and, but I thought about it, and it was one of the most interesting ways to put the disease in, and thinking about it in terms of predisposing, triggering, and maintaining factors, a part of this illness. And so predisposing factors are probably genetic issues or environmental issues that you've, you've kind of held within yourself at that time. Tr there's usually a trigger component, and that's not necessarily just the trigger at the start, but that could be a long-term stressor that's been slowly building. It could also be something that's coming and going constantly, setting people off all the time. And then there's the maintaining factor, which is what's keeping this going for this, such a long time that these things can keep happening, which is usually a combination of the first two, um, most likely. We, you know, but there are other ways. So I like the way of explaining it that way. So with something like mold, I would tend to look at it as a triggering factor, which could also be involved as a maintaining factor, depending on the individual in question. Um, but studying mold itself is quite complex, I think. Uh, a number of people are trying to do that around the world. I knew people in Australia who were interested in doing this. Um, and I was speaking to them a little bit before I came over here. But it is something that um, requires um, a lot more thought and in going into it. And it's something of an avenue of, of research that's left to be discovered, I guess, when we have more resources at hand. Well, Chris. Good luck to you, and thank you so much for thank coming. Thank you very much. You're a well. very interesting thank you. young man, if I might call you a young man. Yes, I am a young man still, I guess. <laughs> thank you so much for coming on thank our broadcast, you. and good luck to you and the OMF.